Welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Linda Young. The epidemic of opioid and prescription drug abuse and misuse continues to affect individuals and families across the Commonwealth, regardless of location, economic status, or age. In 2014, the state saw nearly 1,100 confirmed cases of fatal opioid overdoses. In the last five years, nearly 3,800 people have died from overdoses. State and local leaders have made fighting this epidemic a priority, as have legislators, law enforcement officers, and public health officials. Yet, despite many innovative efforts, overdoses and deaths continue to occur. This edition of Physician Focus will examine the factors that lead to opioid abuse, its impact on residents, what is currently being done, and what additional efforts might be undertaken to curb this abuse. With me for this discussion are two physicians who have been at the forefront of addressing this epidemic, Dr. Monica Burrell and Dr. Dennis Dimitri. Dr. Burrell is the Commissioner of Public Health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. She was appointed to that post in February 2015 and is responsible for leading the state's response to the opioid crisis. Board certified in internal medicine with a master's degree in public health from Harvard University, she was formerly Chief Medical Officer of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless and has practiced medicine for 20 years in neighborhood health centers and hospitals. Dr. Dimitri is the President of the Massachusetts Medical Society, the statewide professional association of physicians. Board certified in family medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Family Physicians, he is Clinical Associate Professor and Vice Chair of the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at UMass Memorial Medical Center and UMass Medical School. Welcome, doctors. Thank you, Thank Linda. Thank you for coming and joining me today. Thank you. So I'm going to start out with asking you this question. Where are we right now? What's the current situation and the impact of this opioid abuse? Well, first I want to thank you for covering this important issue. It's so important that we talk about this, we make sure we're educated and we understand the scope of the problem. Um, I want to say that for the Baker administration, this is our top public health priority. Um, it, as um, you may have heard Governor Baker talk about as he was on the campaign trail, he heard about family suffering from the results of this crisis. As we know from our medical work that the burden of substance use disorder is really rising rapidly. You mentioned over 1,100 opioid-related deaths in the last year, skyrocketing over the last decade or so. So as we think about this, the um, governor's working group came together last year to really find out what's, what's going on around the Commonwealth, speaking to over 1,100 different individuals and hearing their stories about how they're suffering, and came together with an action plan that had 65 concrete recommendations and 19-step action plan looking across the public health spectrum of prevention intervention, treatment, and recovery, and how we can intervene in each of those areas. So can you tell me who's being affected by this? Who are we talking about here? When you had mentioned things had skyrocketed and mm -hmm. such, who's, who are we talking about? We're really talking about uh, the entire spectrum of the population of the Commonwealth. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, whether you live uh, in the inner city or out in the rural areas, whether you're in the Berkshires or on the Cape. This is a problem that has really permeated across all parts of our society. And, uh, and I think it has really increase the awareness on the part of people that none of us are safe from this, that all of us have the potential to be vulnerable, and that all of us need to be engaged in trying to do something about this epidemic. The other thing that we were concerned about, um, your internal medicine, your family medicine, I'm pediatrics, the effect that it has on the families. Can you comment a little bit on that? I think that all of us have had the unfortunate experience of uh, seeing what a devastating impact this can have on the families that we take care of. Uh, all of us have had uh, mothers or fathers come into our offices crying and asking us, can you please help me with my son or my daughter who's suffering and who hasn't been able to uh, emerge from uh, their problems with opioids. Uh, families are devastated by this. Uh, young people are dying uh, at what should be the 
uh, beginning of their of their lives. They, we're losing so many of them. So it's it's had a tragic effect on families all across Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And I think when you think about the families, the other piece about it is because of the opiate's effect on the brain, people don't think rationally who are suffering from substance use disorder. So it's very hard for family members, friends, people who love and care about them to understand why they're making the decisions they make. And it makes it makes a relationship so hard and challenging yes. in so many ways. Yes, I think that's a very good point, too. So let's go back to um, how do we get in this pickle? It's, it's an awful situation to be in. And we had heard about it a little bit along the way, but we never paid that much attention to it. And then all of a sudden, it's exploded. Mm. How did that happen? Yeah, you know, it's interesting to think about because we know that there's been addiction um, for, for many, many years. And there was crack cocaine, there's alcohol, there's been past heroin epidemics. What's different about this one is when you ask individuals how they came to their current addiction, so many of them talk about it starting with a prescription from the doctor's office. So they talk about either a prescription that they personally got or a family member or a friend that they had access to. So really, that's a stark contrast to prior epidemics like this. The, the other piece that I think has contributed to this has been a, a change in the medical profession's approach to the treatment of pain. Mm -hmm. um, and for many, many years, especially in the last couple of decades of the 20th century, many physicians were very reluctant to prescribe opioids because there was so much fear about their potential for addiction. Mm -hmm. um, but appropriately, there was a push for more use of opioids in certain situations, patients who had end-of-life issues, uh, patients who had cancer pain. And unfortunately, the pendulum swung so far towards uh, more aggressive treatment of pain that we began to see a push for the use of opioids in what's called chronic non-malignant pain. Uh, people who have had um, sore backs for a long time or people with other um, chronic pain conditions. And um, they, they need to have their pain and suffering addressed, but um, we uh, need to be very careful about how we use opioids for that pain and suffering because it can create so much difficulty and problem. We had a really a sort of perfect storm that occurred at the uh, end of the 1990s where uh, accrediting organizations such as the Joint Commission, which looks at healthcare organizations, uh, talked about creating a fifth vital sign where we tried to measure people's pain. Um, the, uh, um, the Veterans Administration really pushed for more aggressive management of pain at that time. And some of the pharmaceutical companies came out with long-acting opioids, which we initially thought could be used much more safely and without so much risk of abuse. That turned out not to be true. So we created a problem for ourselves by prescribing opioids much more freely over the last 15 years than we had um, in years prior to that. I think what we also had heard is that many of the deaths aren't necessarily from opioid overdose, but from heroin mm -hmm. overdose. Now, how does that happen? You know, I think um, one important thing to remember about today's heroin, because we're talk when we talk about these deaths and many people starting with opioids, when they sometimes switch to heroin, the heroin that's available today is becoming more pure and more pure, and that means more deadly. So the risk of actually dying from it or for it being mixed with fentanyl, which is mm -hmm. so much more potent than heroin, is so high. And that's why we see these rates of you know, 1,100 deaths now, whereas in 2004, there were 456. Mm -hmm. So it's really a combination of all of these deadly reasons, really, that we're in the situation we're in now. And I think a lot of the reasons they turn to heroin is because they can no longer get the opioids, or they no longer, they somehow feel a stigmata to go and continue to ask for prescriptions. So once they're addicted, they then have to have something. So they go to street drugs, such as, as you had mentioned, such as heroin. So I think that you don't think about that necessarily right. is going into that. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of an unintended consequence of starting to ratchet down some of the opioid prescribing that's been going on. 
um, we've really, at the Medical Society, pushed for physicians to understand that they need to be a little bit more careful about um, the numbers of opioids that they're prescribing to patients so that they don't end up being diverted from somebody's medicine cabinet mm -hmm. to somebody else who's going to misuse them. And as we've ratcheted down the number of opioids, uh, prescription opioids that are circulating in our society, those who've become dependent upon them will turn to street drugs to satisfy their cravings. Yes. And I think on that point, it is really important that our response has to be multi-pronged. So the response has to come with using every tool in the toolbox. So in addition to decreasing the number of opiate pills that are out there right, for people to divert and use, we have to then also make sure for the people who are already suffering from substance use disorder that there's enough treatment available, yes. that them and their families and their doctors know where to obtain that treatment, and to make sure that they're, when they're in recovery, there's safe places and drug-free places for them to recover as well. So it's really part of a spectrum that starts at, you know, prevention by having less pills out there. And other states have shown that as they decrease the number of pills, that overdose death rate does go down. So it does have an impact, but not if we do that alone. And so it's so important that we involve the other sectors as well. And one um, unique thing I feel about the approach we're currently using is that it is multi-sectorial. So medicine alone will not solve this problem, right, if it's just the medical community. If it's just the public health community, we won't solve it alone. We need the education community. We need law enforcement. We need parent groups, community members to all come together and look at it from every angle so that we can attack it with every tool we have. So that's a very nice lead in to my next question, which is looking at what is the role for the physicians in this? And I know the public health department and the medical society have really been leaders in in doing something and it's come about very quickly mm -hmm. and uh, it looks like it's um, it's gotten an awful lot of support you had mentioned some I think um, a lot of it is education as you had mentioned mm -hmm. Dennis can you tell us a little bit about what the Massachusetts Medical Society has done with that We've, uh, we've done a, a number of different approaches to try and help our physicians better understand what role they may play in trying to solve this problem. Um, the first one, I think, was really just raising their consciousness, just as we need to raise the consciousness of the public mm -hmm. about the seriousness of this uh, opioid epidemic. Our own physician practitioners needed to better understand it as well. Um, as Monica had mentioned earlier, uh, the, the vast majority of individuals who misuse opioids today are starting with a pill, not with a needle. And, uh, and I think our physicians didn't truly realize just uh, how much we were contributing to that. So um, we have um, sponsored a number of seminars um, at our society headquarters that have been uh, well attended by physicians. We've put a lot of uh, education up on our website for all prescribers, not just for physicians, but physicians, dentists, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, um, all of those who prescribe opioids so that they can learn better how to be safe about their prescribing, how to identify and advance those patients who would be at risk for addiction and misuse of opioids and to be more cautious in prescribing for those individuals. And uh, to learn more about uh, the, the way that we need to approach the treatment of individuals who have substance use disorders, um, trying to get more of our physicians trained, for instance, in identifying the problem, number one, and then participating in what's called medication-assisted treatment so that, uh, so that patients will be able to get some help for, for their problem. So we are trying to make sure that all the physicians across the state understand that. And I'll, I'll turn to, to Monica and, and, and ask her to talk a little bit more about what we've done with um, education at the medical student yes. level because clearly it's been identified that medical students needed to better understand the issues around opioids and substance use disorder. So we've worked together a little bit on that as well. Yeah, and I really want to say that under Dennis's leadership, what the Massachusetts Medical Society has done to do outreach to their members around education is really a national model. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really been remarkable the um, ways to capture individuals to get them the education they need. Because when we think about the prevention, there's the prevention at the individual side. So we want to make sure they understand the risks of opiate use, of substance use disorder, early signs, right? So that teachers know what to do, parents know what to do, children are taught early about this, and then there's 
is the prevention side that is around the prescribers. So when we think about that, I was really struck. Um, Mass Medical Society came together with the administration um, to think about how we can look at our current learners who are tomorrow's prescribers so that they're educated in how to safely prescribe and provide pain management and balance that with potential opiate misuse. And I was really struck by our medical students. We met with medical students from all four medical schools here in Massachusetts. And I was struck by how little, how uncomfortable they felt with dealing with these issues about assessing an individual's pain using an evidence-based model, about understanding non-opiate options for pain management, about how to refer individuals or how to help them if they did have substance use disorder. So we came together with the four medical schools to develop a set of core competencies. And this was really a first in the nation look to say, what can we agree on? Every medical student must learn as a competency around these issues before they graduate medical school so that when they do become prescribers, they are then well equipped and feel comfortable. Because it's about being trained and being comfortable with how to manage these issues. After the medical schools, the all three Massachusetts dental schools have also adopted these core competencies and we're working with the other prescribers too now. So this is to make sure that the next generation of prescribers, in addition to the ones that are currently prescribing, are really well equipped because this key issue is we have to be able to manage pain and we have to balance that with these potential for opioid misuse and I want to add that one of the key pieces of the core competencies is thinking about stigma so our own potential um, professional stigma that we may inadvertently have as well as the societal stigma about coming forward if you have substance use disorder or a family member does I'm so struck I was struck by um, a woman was talking about her daughter who was suffering from substance use disorder and she said she felt so isolated from her community and and, you know, people didn't ask about it. People were hush-hush about it. And she said, if my daughter had cancer, which has the same potential for death, people would be coming over with a casserole. They would yes. be accompanying us to appointments, being as supportive as possible. So that piece of it, too, is really important to start addressing. I think that's a very, a very good point. Um, can I know that Massachusetts became a national model and got a lot of national recognition for doing all the education and for taking it down to the medical school level, which I think was so crucial and was just a, a wonderful thing to happen. So now we're sort of looking forward. What's being done now? And the two things I'd like to hear you discuss are the, you had mentioned the governor's task force mm -hmm. and then also just the um, public health response. So you had mentioned a little bit about you recognize this is a disease. Mm -hmm. This is not people that just do this because they want to. And um, I'd kind of like to hear your thoughts on that. So whoever wants to take either one of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, at the Medical Society, uh, we're continuing to try and innovate as much as we can. We've created a, a task force on the opioid issue um, that we, where we've brought together physicians of all stripes, um, doctors who treat chronic pain, doctors who treat uh, individuals with substance use disorder, primary care physicians, oncologists who obviously have lots of patients with pain issues. Um, and uh, what we want to do is go forward with, uh, with educational opportunities that will really balance what Monica was talking about before, the need to make sure that those patients who have pain are still able to access the care that they need when they need it, but it's done in a safe fashion and that those other patients who um, have the um, uh, unfortunate experience of uh, experiencing substance use disorder are identified and are helped as well. And um, this has to be really something that cuts across all medical specialties. Uh, and all of us uh, who, who are seeing patients need to feel comfortable with um, not only appropriate prescribing, but how do we approach and help those patients who've uh, developed dependency and, and maybe even addiction? And I know you had talked about in, in the beginning part about the governor's task force, but looking at, um, I'm just looking at the mental health facilities that mm -hmm. need to be on board with this, the availability of Narcan, and you can yep. explain with, with what Narcan does. Um, the prescription monitoring program. Mm -hmm. If you could spend just very briefly a few minutes telling us about that, that would be helpful too. Yeah, so I think this frame is useful to think, you know, what do we mean by this public health approach to mm -hmm. this? So it's really taking the lens back and saying, here's the individual who's suffering, and how do we pull the lens way back to their community, to what we can do as a state 
all of us in every sector that this person is affected by in order to help them. So if you go back to the um, spectrum I spoke to you about, so prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery. So in prevention, we've talked a lot about educating both individuals and prescribers. In the intervention area, we have a couple of areas we're focusing on through the governor's task force. Number one is making sure that Narcan is available. Narcan, or naloxone, is a medication that can be given to someone when they've overdosed immediately to prevent them from dying. And I think it's important to know, because some people are going to say, well, I, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's quite easy. It goes in your nose. <laughs> so it's fairly easy. That's right. So, so there's no needles involved. It's mm. a you know, it's a quick thing to put together and it can be given in each nostril and can really save a person. And Massachusetts was one of the first states to put this medication into the hands of individuals who might be around someone who's using yeah. and also get it into cities and towns so that our first responders have it. And we have documented thousands and thousands of reversals of opioid deaths. So it's a really important tool, as is the prescription prescription monitoring system. And the prescription monitoring program is a program that all prescribers have access to and pharmacists where they can look and see with the patient in front of them what other pharmacies they've used and what other prescribers may have given them an opiate so they can assess the full clinical picture when making a decision to look for things like drug diversion or drug interactions that may not be safe for the patient. And I would say that, you know, the the physicians in the state are very happy about the fact that under Dr. Burrell's leadership, we're getting a new prescription monitoring program that is going to be mm -hmm. much, much more user friendly. And those physicians who've used the prescription monitoring program in, in the past know that it can be incredibly helpful to identify what are sometimes referred to as doctor shoppers, those uh, individuals who are sometimes going from one physician to another seeking opioids. Um, with this tool embedded in our electronic medical records, mm -hmm. we're going to be able to much better um, avoid the danger that um, occurs when patients do doctor shopping like that. So we're, we at the Medical Society are very appreciative of the fact that um, DPH has put a lot of effort into improving and updating the prescription monitoring program so that it will be a much more effective tool for all of us to use. I think that's very key and a lot of people don't know about that. Mm -hmm. We have a few minutes left. Do you have, if you can do this for me, <laughs> there, there is a very um, a groundbreaking law that went into effect a few weeks ago on this. And can you tell me um, what does it mean for us as physicians mm -hmm. and what does it mean for our patients, the opioid law that went through? Yeah. Um, well, there, for physicians, there's uh, a, a number of <clears throat> things in this law that will have an impact on, on how we prescribe and will hopefully lead to safer prescribing for us. So for instance, physicians will be limited to prescribing only seven days worth of opioids the first time they're prescribing to somebody. Um, there will be ex exceptions in there for special circumstances, but I think this will really help to raise the awareness on the part of physicians that these are very powerful and uh, helpful but potentially dangerous uh, medications that we're prescribing. So you, one needs to be cautious about how one does that. Um, another important piece that's in there is the uh, mandate that for patients who present to an emergency department or hospital with either an opioid overdose or other, other evidence of, um, of addictive behaviors, that there is a requirement that they be um, evaluated within 24 hours by a professional for the issues that they're having with substance use disorder and uh, be helped with enrollment in a substance use disorder uh, treatment program. So these are things that will help physicians um, help our patients. Right. So we are almost out of time. Um, Monica, I'm going to give you a chance to briefly tell us any last thoughts or something else you'd like us to hear about this topic. Um, I know you could go on for like an hour. Yeah, that's, that's okay. right. That's right. Um, well, first of all, thank you for covering this because it's such a critical issue that we have to keep talking about it. You know, f people often ask me, what, how would I measure success? Mm -hmm. And of course, we are watching the tragic opiate deaths and we need to bend that curve and start to bring down those deaths. And some of these issues that we're talking about will 
do that. So um, the bill that we talked about that is now the STEP law has so many components in it that will decrease the number of opiates that are available. For um, patients, there's also an opportunity to do a partial fill so they don't have to take all of the pills home. There's an um, opportunity to ask for a directive so they don't get opiates. We're also increasing education in school, so there's lots of different angles where we'll start to see a difference made. I must tell you, as a primary care intest for me, internist, for me, success will be when I have a patient who has a substance use disorder and a patient who's having a heart attack, that they can go and get care as treatment on demand when they need it at the right level of care. Yeah, that's a wonderful statement. Dennis, any last thoughts from you? Well, I couldn't agree more with what you just said about mm -hmm. the need to um, be able to address substance use disorders as a chronic disease, just like we treat diabetes or heart disease. And I think one of the things that's really changing the conversation around this has been the state's effort led by the governor to really remove stigma from the issue of substance use disorder. Um, that's been an incredibly positive move. Um, I applaud the fact that um, our state government has been willing to make that kind of a statement to the public. Um, that can be just incredibly helpful for allowing uh, patients and their families to realize that they're not alone, that there are people who care about this um, that want to help them and uh, hopefully they will seek that uh, help. Well thank you those are great statements and thank you so much for joining us on this crucial crucial topic. Thanks so much for having thank us. You. Thank you. For more information on opioid prescription drugs and what you can do to help reduce the misuse and abuse of these medicines visit our home page at physicianfocus.org. I'm Dr. Linda Young thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Dennis Dimitri. I'm Dr. Monica Burrell. Prescription drugs are valuable medicines and when taken under a doctor's supervision provide effective pain relief for many conditions. But the abuse of these powerful drugs has become a serious public health problem in Massachusetts and across the country, resulting in the needless deaths of thousands of people. If you are prescribed opioids or pain medication, talk with your doctor about the risks and benefits of the medicines and explore different ways to treat your pain. The safe use of prescription drugs comes when physicians and patients work together to promote healing and good health. Medicines cure, heal, and relieve pain. Use them carefully, store them securely, and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. What you do can make a difference. For more information, visit the websites of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health or the Massachusetts Medical Society.
I'm Dr. Dennis Dimitri. I'm Dr. Monica Burrell. Prescription drugs are valuable medicines and when taken under a doctor's supervision provide effective pain relief for many conditions. But the abuse of these powerful drugs has become a serious public health problem in Massachusetts and across the country, resulting in the needless deaths of thousands of people. If you are prescribed opioids or pain medication, talk with your doctor about the risks and benefits of the medicines and explore different ways to treat your pain. The safe use of prescription drugs comes when physicians and patients work together to promote healing and good health. Medicines cure, heal, and relieve pain. Use them carefully, store them securely, and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. What you do can make a difference. For more information, visit the websites of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health or the Massachusetts Medical Society.